everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics, 6th edition, by N. Gregory Mankiw, and we're going to be doing chapter 6, problem number 3. The problem begins with, a recent study found that the demand and supply schedules for Frisbees are as follows. And I just put the information up here for reference. And just as a reminder, a demand schedule or a supply schedule just means that we're listing in a table our price versus quantity demanded or price versus quantity supplied rather than putting that information on a graph directly. But the, the concepts are still the same. So here we have our supply and demand information. And you'll notice that the quantity demanded and quantity supplied are in millions, so that at least makes a little bit more sense than literally having the market demand one Frisbee or something like that. And part A of the question says, what are the equilibrium price and quantity of Frisbees? Now, we know that our condition for economic equilibrium is that the price is going to adjust until we get a steady state where the quantity demanded at that price is the same as the quantity supplied at that price. The reason, of course, being that at that price, there's not going to be any upward or downward pressure because everybody who's willing and able to pay that price for the item can actually get the item, and suppliers aren't going to have any of the item left over. So we can look at our information here, and we can say that the free market equilibrium is just the price where quantity demanded and quantity supplied are the same. So we notice for a while when we have prices that are high, we have what's called a surplus, and that the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. So we have extra supply. But then when we get down to a price of $8, we see that our condition for equilibrium is actually satisfied, in that at a price of $8, consumers are demanding 6 million Frisbees, and suppliers are in fact supplying the market with those same 6 million Frisbees. So we could just write that down to keep track of it. We could say that P star, U stars for equilibrium prices and quantities. So I'd say my equilibrium price P star would be $8. And my equilibrium quantity, it doesn't matter which one of these I pull because they're by definition the same thing. We'll call that Q star, again for equilibrium. And our Q star is just six, of course, six million. If you want to think about how the information gleaned from our supply and demand schedule corresponds to what we've seen graphically, that's easy enough to do. If, and I didn't graph this to scale, but if I were to go through and plot the points where I have price versus quantity demanded, that would in fact give me my demand curve. If I were to graph price versus quantity supplied, and plot those combinations of points, that would just give me a supply curve. And so what we'll notice that when I say my equilibrium price is $8 and my equilibrium quantity is 6, that that's just saying the point of intersection between the supply and demand curve is at a price of $8 and a quantity of 6. Now the reason that I put this out here for you is because when we're going to be talking about our price floor and our price ceiling, it's helpful to think both about how to identify those and identify their impacts on the supply and demand schedules directly, but also bring that back to what this means in terms of our graph. So part B says Frisbee manufacturers persuade the government that Frisbee production improves scientists' understanding of aerodynamics and thus is important for national security. A concerned Congress votes to impose a price floor $2 above the equilibrium price. And then we're asked, what is the new market price and how many Frisbees are sold? So if our price floor or our legally mandated minimum price, we can't go below a floor, is set $2 above the equilibrium price, we can say, well, we know the equilibrium price. So this must tell us that our price floor, which is called PF, is set at $10. And we could put that on our graph here, maybe $10, just somewhere up here. So graphically, our price floor of $10 would look like this here. And we can go ahead and we can see, we can put specific numbers on this. 
because we can understand graphically that this is A, going to be a binding price floor because it's excluding the possibility of the original market equilibrium. So we can think about what's going to happen. At these higher prices, we have a surplus because we have supply exceeding demand. So our producers are trying to, going to try to undercut each other on price until we hit this price floor of $10, and then we're just going to get stuck. So we could actually say that our equilibrium price with the price floor, when a price floor is binding, is the price that the price floor is set at. So we could say that in this case, I'll call this P star sub PF for price floor. That this is going to be an equilibrium price, but only because we've mandated that basically supply and demand are going to be out of balance in the steady state. And we could put some numbers on this. We can notice our numbers here. At a price of $10, we have a quantity demanded of 2. So I can put a 2 here. And we have a quantity supplied of 12. So notice, again, at this price, our quantity supplied is just given by the supply curve. So it must be the case that this number here is a 12. So we can also think about, it says, how many Frisbees are sold? Well, we have at this price consumers wanting to buy 2 million Frisbees and producers wanting to sell at this price 12 million. But it takes both a buyer and a seller to actually make a transaction happen. So the number of buyers is going to be the limiting factor here. And this 2 million is actually going to be our equilibrium quantity with the price floor. So it would be really nice. Suppliers would really want to produce and sell 12 million at this price. Unfortunately, they're not able to do so because they're limited by the number of customers that actually show up at their door. So we could say here that our Q star with the price floor, our equilibrium number of transactions, or steady state number of transactions, when we have this price floor in place, is in fact 2 million. You'll notice that I put in some labeling here so we can keep track of where all of our relevant prices and quantities are located graphically, as well as just putting them as part of our, or as an addition to our supply and demand schedule as numbers over here. Here, of course, we had our original equilibrium price at $8 and our original equilibrium quantity at 6 That's just the intersection of our supply and demand curve. For our price floor, we had our equilibrium price under the price floor be at $10 because we were pushing down to the price floor but couldn't get to the original equilibrium price. So I labeled that here. And then our Q star under the price floor was this $2 million because demand was the limiting factor in how many transactions were actually going to happen. So we've got that, and now we actually have a part C of the problem. So part C says, I rate college students march on Washington and demand a reduction in the price of Frisbees. An even more concerned Congress votes to repeal the price floor and impose a, pr impose a price ceiling $1 below the former price floor. What is the new market price? how many Frisbees are sold. So let's read this carefully. Now we have a price ceiling, which is a legally mandated maximum price. And that price ceiling is going to be set $1 below the former price floor. And we decided that the price floor was set at $10. So this means that the price ceiling would be set at $9. So we want to think about what the market impact of that is. Because we're being asked what is the new market price and how many Frisbees are sold. So what we're being told, if I were to draw this in my graph, is that we're setting a maximum price that we're allowed to charge in the market at $9. And we can think about what that means. That just means that producers are not allowed to charge more than $9 for the Frisbees. But what we'll notice is that this price ceiling is above the price that would normally or naturally occur 
in the market, which we already said was $8. So this price ceiling is actually non-binding that just having a price ceiling of $9 doesn't mean that the market price is going to be $9, that the market price is only going to be $9 if the price ceiling is preventing the normal natural market outcome, right? Whereas here, it's not. So it's important to remember, it's not like the price ceiling drives the price up to $9, whereas it would otherwise be $8. The price ceiling is what we call non-binding. It just says, eh. You can't charge more than $9, Marcus says I wasn't going to anyway. And it actually brings us back to this original market equilibrium. So we can say in this situation here that our equilibrium price with the price ceiling is what it was before, which is $8. And our equilibrium quantity with the price ceiling, again, because the price ceiling is non-binding, is going to be 6. So we can see here, you know, maybe it made sense to put a price ceiling so that if we had something that shifted around supplier demand, we would prevent the price of Frisbees from spiking at some point in the future above $9. But for now, this price ceiling is not particularly effective, which might be fine because this price ceiling actually results in a higher quantity of Frisbees being bought and sold than the price floor did, even though the supposed goal of the price floor was in fact to encourage production and consumption of Frisbees. 